Thank you. Thank you. As Pastor Brian said, my name is Austin Weaver, and if you don't know me, you are really missing out. I will tell you that. So I'm just totally teasing. Hey, uh, before we get started, uh, I just want to, to take a minute. I've got some uh, close friends, Amber and, and um, Matt Phipps. Uh, and their son Griffin. Amber is the mother, and she's going to be giving her kidney uh, this uh, t t on Tuesday up in Mayo Clinic, and their son is three years old, um, and he's the recipient. recipient. Um, and I don't know if uh, Steve and Denise are here. Is, is you guys are there. Um, could we just take just a, a minute as a church family? We're going to pray for you, and I've already talked to the worship team that I lead uh, every third week, and uh, we as a, a team decided that we're going to we're going to fast on Tuesday for this. This is going to be a six to ten hour operation. This is a big deal. Uh, their family is going to be spending six to eight weeks up there. Uh, Matt gets two weeks of vacation, and then um, and then he's got to return to to work on on February five. So this is this is a big deal for their family. Um, but can we just take a minute? Would you guys stand up and maybe if there's one or two people uh, that are around them that, that uh, we could just pray for them and, and you could just surround them, put your hands on them. But let's just believe. Jesus, we believe and we uh, just speak to this surgery that there would be life, there would be healing, there would be zero complications, Lord. You go before them. You know exactly what needs to be done. And so we pray healing and life over Griffin, over Amber, Lord. I pray that your spirit would come in like a blanket of peace and fill their hearts, Lord. And I just pray that health over everyone that is involved, Jesus. And we are believing and trusting in you, God. You spoke to the storm and you calmed it, Lord. And so we are speaking to this and declaring healing in Jesus' name. And we believe it. And everybody said, amen. 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 So keep them in your prayers. If you feel led to fast on Tuesday, Griffin and Amber, Stephen, Denise, I know they're going to be up there along with with Matt's folks as well. So um, it is great to be here this morning. And as Pastor uh, Brian said, we're in this series titled, This Is Us. And we're going through the attributes that God has called his church, that he has called you, that he has called New Hope to be. And at New Hope, we have this policy of the everyone policy. That means, uh, ask yourself, if everybody evangelized and then reached out to the lost and hurting people the way that you reached out to lost and hurting people, would we be reaching people? If everybody forgave the way that you forgave, would this be a forgiving place? Would this be a loving, inviting place? If everybody gave the way that you gave, would we still have missionaries on the field? If everybody served the way that you served, would we still have need for volunteers? Um, we want you to grow into ma the mature Christians that God has called you to become. But how many know that along with growing comes pains? Right? God might be calling you a little bit into a, a painful season of growing. Forgiving is difficult. Giving takes trust. Relationships take risk. Some of these things and these attributes don't come natural to us like serving. But these are the attributes that God has called us to, for this is us. Now this morning, we're going to be talking about the importance of being relational. Now when I invite people to church, and uh, oftentimes I get the, the question, What's your church like? And, and I usually tell them three things. I say, first, we're relational, we're multi-generational, and it's a great place to raise your family. This church is relational. If you, if you don't know that, it starts from the top down. All of the pastors, I believe our cell phone numbers are published in your bulletin. You guys have access to us. A pastor is a relational term. That means a shepherd. That means I watch out for you, okay? Um, if, if you're just an average Joe in the community, you cannot call me your pastor— you shouldn't call me your pastor because it is a relational term. And, and, and so this morning, um, I, I'm so thankful that we have a church that is, is, has been founded upon relationships. How many know, my dad uh, started the church 27 years ago. How many know that this is a pretty relational church, right? Y you feel somewhat connected. I, I give uh, glory to God for that, for placing that uh, desire and that vision in my dad's heart that this church needs to be relational. But my dad, uh, you know, has taken this to the next level. He's, he has said, been known to say things such as, I'm the most relational person that I know, right? <laughs> really? Who says that? That's, that's weird. That's like me saying, I'm the best preacher that I know. There, I said it, you know? 
But the, but the difference is, if you were to ask me what are my hobbies, I would tell you hunting, fishing, sports, and music. If you were to ask my dad what his hobbies are, he would tell you people. Why is my dad so relational? Why does my dad care so much about people? Why does he have so much patience and love and kindness and generosity? Why is my dad the most relational person that he knows? And I believe that he has grasped the heart of God because God is all about relationships. God is all about relationships. He wants you to be first in a relationship with him and then in a relationship with each other. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus uh, speaks to his disciples and he's questioned what is the greatest commandment. And he says, first, love God, relationship with God. Second, love people. Relationships matter. At the end of this sermon, I'm going to give you the opportunity for anyone here that is not in a relationship with Jesus to enter into one. Jesus wants to enter into your heart. He wants to forgive you of your past. He wants to put you on a path of righteousness and give you purpose and meaning in life. You're going to have that opportunity. And if you're already in a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to call you to a deeper action and more uh, being in more relationships, being deeper in your relationships, and, and to have an effort to be more. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be answering two questions this morning. Genesis chapter 2, if you don't know where Genesis is, it's right after the table of contents. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, the two questions that we are answering is, why does being relational matter? And how do I become more relational? Why it matters and how to become more. But before we read, let's pray. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would just flow through me and that you'd speak through me, God. I pray that defensive walls would be torn down, that we would um, be able to hear your spirit speak to us through the word, uh, through, through, through what you have to say, Lord. I pray that we would leave here um, not unchanged. I, pr I pray that by your spirit we would leave different, God. For those that are not in a relationship this morning, I pray that they would experience your love and your forgiveness and your mercy in a real way. And those of us that are, Lord, let us not leave um, just saying, oh, great job. And so, God, by your spirit, just have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15, reading through 20. The Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds in the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man would call each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now I find it so interesting that even though Adam lived in a perfect world, that God still saw in his heart the need for relationship. Think about it. Adam is in a sinless garden. The perfect garden. I believe, uh, and I don't know, I can't prove this uh, um, scripturally, but I believe that before the fall of man, before sin entered the world, I don't believe that there were thorns. I don't believe that there were ticks. I don't believe that there were all these things that come with, um, you know, gardens and stuff. This was a perfect garden, and it's him and God. What else more could you want? But God looks, and in verse 18, the only thing that he says is not good in the creation story is what? That man is alone. It is not good that man was alone. The first reason why being relational matters is because we were created for it. You were created to be in relationships. Now, I'm not talking about romantic relationships. I'm just simply talking about relationships. If you've spent much time in the church and you've likely heard um, a preacher or someone just kind of describe this, this God-shaped hole in your heart where you could spend your entire life trying to fill that hole in your life, in, in your heart, with, with all sorts of things, whether it's success in the business or it's a marriage or, or these different things. How many have heard about that God-shaped hole in your heart and, and God is the only thing that can fill that hole, right? And that's very true. And may, maybe that's you this morning. You've been searching, and you've been, been looking, and you've been trying to fill your life with all sorts of things, and you still feel empty. 
Let me tell you, Jesus is here. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to enter your life. He's ready to give you purpose and meaning. He's ready to fill that void in your life. So be ready at the end. I'll give you that opportunity to accept Jesus in your life. But how many know that that in our hearts, we don't just have a God-shaped hole, but we have a people-shaped hole? We have a people-shaped hole. We were created to be in relationships. We desire and we long to have relationships with other people. Now, whether you admit it or not, God created you to need others peop- other people. Did you know that Jesus even needed other people? Whoa, 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 Jesus didn't need anything. He was God. No, he did need other people. Because when he left, if, if, if he didn't invest in relationships, who would have preached the good news? Who would have preached the message of grace and mercy rather than law and judgment? Who would have formed the first church? The same way that Jesus needs relationship, we need relationships. Why? To fulfill God's mission. Jesus needed other people, Jesus needed relationships on earth to fulfill his mission on earth. And in the same way, you need other people around you, godly people, godly men and women, to surround you so that you can fulfill your mission in your life. Proverbs 27, 17 says, you, you, you need friends that will speak truth into your life. It says, um, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You need friends that will dream with you and push you and encourage you and hold you accountable to the things that God has called you. If you are married, God has called you to be the best spouse in the world. And you need someone in your life that will speak life and truth into into your marriage. If if you're a student, middle school, high school, you guys with me? Middle school, high school, college, you guys need godly relationships to hold you accountable so that you can be everything that God has called you to be. You need godly people in your life so that you can fulfill your life's mission. But you know what the problem is? Is a lot of people— they spend more time investing in ungodly relationships rather than godly relationships. And you wonder, why am I struggling so much in my faith? Why am I so up and down? Why do I feel depressed? Why, do my, why am I this? Because you're investing in the wrong things. And that might be true for other people in this room. You cannot be the Lone Ranger. You need relationships to f- fulfill God's mission in life. Now, I'm going to ask a question, and I want complete and total honesty, which I would expect nothing less than a church. Otherwise, God will zap you dead right at this minute. That's sarcasm, and that's not true and unbiblical. How many of you in this room would say that in some point in your life, you have been hurt by a relationship? Whether a friendship, a marriage, whatever it is, okay? Everybody's hand is up as I expect. Now, how many of you would say that you have hurt someone else in a relationship, right? You've done that? Okay, there's the people with your hands down, you may have misheard my question, um, because your hands should be up. Um, I want to take a a minute and, and talk about hurts and risks, because relationships come with the risk of hurt, and they also come with the risk of rejection. Some of you this morning are living in isolation because you are so sick and tired of being hurt and rejected that you found it easier to live by yourself rather than to open up and, and with the possibility of risk and hurt. Can I just tell you that, that Jesus was rejected and he was hurt? Jesus knows exactly how you're feeling. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes to his hometown. He goes back to the people that he grew up eating dinner with across the street. He went back to the people that babysat him, that likely changed his diapers, that traveled to Jerusalem with him, that played with these children, now grown men and, and, and women in the community. And he goes back expecting open arms, and what happens? He is rejected almost to the point where he gets killed, but he slips away. Then he gets rejected by the religious leaders, the people that are supposed to be on his team. And that rejection leads to his long, painful death on the cross. But what does Jesus say on the cross? He says, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
Forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, I don't believe that Jesus in this moment is talking to the Roman soldiers. He may have been talking to the Roman soldiers, but not exclusively. I believe in this moment Jesus is forgiving the people that are responsible for his death. He is forgiving the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priests, the religious leaders, and he's saying, God, forgive them of their ignorance. Forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. These were the people that were supposed to be on his team. These were the people that were supposed to be godly people. These were the people that knew Jesus, yet they were causing this hurt. But what Jesus does in this moment is one of the most remarkable things, and it's so difficult to do. He refuses to pick up that relational hurt because he saw their ignorance. He saw that they were blinded. Did you know that when your family member hurts you, that when your friend hurts you, when your coworker hurts you, when your pastor hurts you, your Sunday school teacher, your brother or sister in Christ hurts you, your child hurts you, your spouse hurts you, did you know likely that they know not what they do? How many of you have hurt someone and you, have, you are completely oblivious to it? You're like, didn't even know it, right? Jesus refused to pick up that relational hurt on the cross. And we ought to be like Christ because they know not what they do. Grab too many pages. Now there's good news and there's bad news when it comes to being relational. The bad news is that close personal relationship will likely cause hurt and pain in the future. There's a a risk of rejection. But the good news is that you don't have to be identified by that rejection. You don't have to be classified by that hurt and the rejection. Jesus was rejected, Jesus was hurt, but that did not identify him, and it doesn't have to identify you. So to the person here this morning that is scared and living in isolation, God understands how you might be feeling, but we can't let fear control us. It may be safer for you to live alone, never opening up to anyone else, but what I'm hoping that you realize this morning is that someone needs you. Someone needs your shoulder to cry on. Someone needs your listening ear. Someone needs your encouragement, your friendship, your love. The same way you need other people. And I might not be able to convince you that you need other people, but I can convince you that someone else needs needs you. In in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it records uh, uh, Jesus saying, um, and it wasn't Jesus at that time, it was someone quoting Jesus, that Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. But the problem is, is we live in a society that's all about what we can get. We're a whole bunch of takers in our marriages. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. No, you give yourself. In in our friendships, it's not about what we can get, it's what we can give. Jesus went around giving all the time, not concerned what he was getting. It is more blessed to be a friend than it is to receive a friend. If you're living in isolation out of fear of being hurt, realize that in protecting yourself, you might be starving someone else of love and, and encouragement and friendship. We see that, that Jesus was not exclusive. He was not cliquish in his relationships. Yeah, sure, there were people that he spent extra time with being his disciples, right? I'm sure he spent a lot of time with those 12 guys. And, and maybe even one of those disciples was his favorite in John, who calls himself the beloved, sort of like my dad calling him the best relational person ever and myself calling myself the the best preacher ever, you know? And so Jesus did have those closer relationships, maybe those relationships that came easier. But we see that everywhere that Jesus went, he was not cliquish and he was not exclusive. Samaritans, Jews, free, slave, men, women. He gave. He brought comfort. He brought hope. He brought peace to all those things, to all those people. You know what I love about this church? is that we can come together, young and old, black, brown, white. We can gather under the unity of Jesus Christ and worship our Lord and Savior. This morning, hear me, this morning some of you need to bust out of your comfort zones and you need to cross some cultural lines and build some friends that someone that looks different than you. 
Some of, some of you might need to, to uh, break generational boundaries and make some friends that are a little bit more seasoned than you and get to know your elders. Some of you might need to cross some economic lines and, 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 and get to know someone different and make some new friends in a different economic circle. Okay? Being relational matters because you were created for it. You need others and others need you. And that's the only way to fulfill God's mission for our lives. So now that we understand that, we need to get practical. We need to figure out how to be more relational. Now think about this. How to be more relational. Think about this. When, when you have a deep, sincere, real relationship, thriving relationship with Jesus Christ, where you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is you pray and you invite God's Holy Spirit into your life, into your mind, to take the reins of your heart, supernatural abilities come. What are those supernatural abilities? To love, to forgive, to be selfless, not selfish, selfless, to be patient, to be kind, to be good. You know, and, and the fruits of the Spirit and all these things become a part of who you are out of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because without Jesus Christ, you're not going to be patient, you're not going to be kind. You're not going to forgive. You're going to hold on to that grudge that your wife did something to you four years ago. If you struggle in your marriage, it could be that one or both of you don't have a real strong relationship with Jesus Christ because he gives us the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness to make relationships work. If, if, if you struggle in your friendships, it could be that that, that one of you or both of you are struggling in your relationship with Christ. You see, we need to bring Jesus into the center of our relationships. Jesus needs to be at the center of it. If Jesus is right here, and God is right here, and I'm right here, and, and my friend or my spouse or whoever it might be, if we pursue Jesus together, we not only grow closer to God, but we grow closer to each other. But the problem is, is in our marriages, one of us pursues God and the other pursues their children. One of us pursues God and the other pursues career. One of us pursues God and, and whatever it might be, we need to place Jesus as the center point of our lives. Not our children, not our jobs, not our spouses. Jesus. So if you struggle with being relational, you first today, you need to have a, a, a real, sincere, self-evaluation moment. Is my relationship with God strong? Am I where I need to be with my relationship with God? And if you have relational issues, you might be in a great place with God, right? It, it, it could be. So I'm not saying that in, in every divorce or in every conflict— that, that uh, it's just because you're not good enough with God, right? I'm not saying that, so don't hear that this morning. But what I'm saying is you need to start with your relationship with God, with more of God. And if that checks out, then I've got two practical steps for you this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Towards the end, verse 42, now in Acts chapter 2, this is right at the beginning of the first century church. These people are just freshly saved. Was that? Dun, 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 dun. Was that? No? Was I hearing things? Did a phone go off? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. I thought it was the, is that the nutcracker? You know what's really scary is um, the older I get, the more I become like my dad. <laughs> don't clap at that. <laughs> oh, don't, don't clap at that. Come on. I need you to support me and encourage me. Okay? I've totally lost my place. Acts 2, that's right. Pastor Brett, would you come to the keyboard? Acts 2, this is the beginning of the church. So, P 
People have just been saved. Peter preaches this message. 3,000 people are saved. And what happens? The Spirit of God enters your heart, and what happens? This is what should happen if you have the Spirit of God in your heart. This is the model that the early church left us. This is, this is the biblical model of the church when you have the Spirit of God in your heart. Acts 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves, the early church, they, the early first believers, they devoted themselves, new hope, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and good, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily to those who were being saved. We see this scripture in the scripture that, that people broke bread together daily. Did you know that a meal is one of, if not the best way to build a relationship. Go on a first date, what do you do? You go out to eat, right? How many like to eat? I, I know I do, right? You have a birthday, what do you do? You go out to dinner. You've got a graduation, someone graduates college or high school, you go out to dinner, you've got an anniversary, Mickey D's all the way, right? Chick-fil-A, that's right. I've got my Chick-fil-A tie on every time I preach, okay? There is no better way, in my opinion, than to get to know someone over a meal. Some of my most deep conversations that I've ever had with anybody, some of the times that I've been able to lead someone to the Lord have been sharing a meal together. Because what, what are you doing in that moment? You're, you're, you're both meeting a physical need, and that brings the common ground. That's the thing that you both have an interest. You're both hungry. You both have to eat at that moment. And so you, you gather together. Elizabeth and I do our best to have at least one, uh, get together with one person or, or one family a week. Unfortunately, uh, Elizabeth is at home uh, today. Uh, her and Sam got sick on Friday. They were doing okay yesterday, and then Sam uh, lost it again this morning. Uh, so she's at home, and we had to cancel our, our dinner on Friday night, you know, and, and I, I look forward to that because I get to meet so many awesome people over a meal, and Elizabeth and, and I have just decided, you know, we've, we've got to eat anyways. I've got to eat lunch anyways. I've, I've got to eat dinner anyways. I'm already preparing food, so I might as well just prepare a little bit extra. It doesn't take that much more, that much more money, and we'll just have someone over. We'll break bread together. You know, I've got a, a funny story that I asked for, per, for, for permission to share of my mom and dad, um, which I, I shouldn't even ask permission because he never asked for permission. But um, a, a number of years ago, uh, my dad had some new people over from the church. They're trying to get to know him. I believe it may have been a, a missions uh, lunch or something. And there's a number of new faces in, in their home. And, and one of the people... Uh, that came at the time was the main marketing director for all of hy V. Eight states, over 200 stores. He is the main marketing guru guy, right? And my dad loved Dolls Fried Chicken, okay? And so what does he do? He orders up some Dolls Fried Chicken. My mom makes the fixings and then proceeds in front of everybody that's there at this dinner to go on and on about how great Dolls Fried Chicken was and how no other grocery store had it right, but Dolls had the breading and everything else right in front of this main marketing director of hy V. But you know, the cool thing about that is that this marketing director and his wife have become some great friends to my parents, and, and they still look back at that meal, and they laugh at the first time that they got together over a meal. So who are you breaking bread with? Is it the same crew week in and week out? We all have to eat, so let's be intentional and reach across the aisle to those around us and break bread. 
The second thing we see from this text is that they devoted themselves to teaching and every day met in the temple courts. The first Christians were dedicated not just to meeting together, but discussing God's word. We have Sunday school so that you can grow closer to God, but you can also grow closer to each other. We have Wednesday night classes so that you can grow closer to God, but also grow, grow, grosser, grow closer to each other. You know, every once in a while I hear of someone, I just, I don't, I don't feel like I know anybody. And sometimes when I hear that, I have to, to think, well, do you come any other times besides just Sunday morning church? Do you come to Sunday school? Do you come to Wednesday night classes? Do you come to men's breakfast? Do you come to, to women's breakfast? Do you, do you help out and, and serve in any area and get to know people? Is, is, are, or are, are all you doing is just coming on a Sunday morning? Oh, my, my teenager just doesn't want to come to youth group because they just, they don't, just don't know anybody. Well, are, are, are they continuing to, to push through? Are, are you signing them up for the Alive Conference where they can connect with God in one of the most powerful ways ever and be right there besides a friend, possibly a new friend for life? The early church devoted themselves to the teaching of God's Word. We have classes. We have Sunday nights. We, we have Celebrate Recovery. We have all these different things so that you can grow closer to God and grow closer to one another. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? And I want to ask two very important questions. First, I want to give the opportunity to anyone here that has not received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have never asked Jesus into your heart to forgive you of your sins. You, you have... You have never repented and said, Lord, I'm sorry. I need you to forgive me. I want purpose. I want value. And I need you to come and be Lord of my life. Not just a sidekick, but Lord, I'm going to do things your way. And so I'm surrendering to you. And you'd say, Austin, for the first time, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask him into my heart. I'm going to turn from my ways and turn towards Christ. Is there anyone here that would say, I want a personal life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ? If that's you, would you raise your hand with every eye closed and every head bowed? Is there anyone here? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that everyone here is in a relationship with you. Continue with your eyes closed and your head bowed. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like God is calling you to do something. Maybe it's just a greater relationship in him and you realize, man, I just need more of God. Maybe God is, is calling you to get to know your church family. Maybe God is telling you to leave your hurts and your rejections at the cross and refuse to pick them up and leave them here this morning. Maybe God is nudging you to open up. Maybe God is pushing you towards a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class or a home group or Celebrate Recovery or whatever it might be. You feel that God has spoken to you and nudged your heart this morning that, that I need to do something. I need, I, I need to, to, to respond to what God has called me this morning. If, if you feel like God, His Holy Spirit, has whispered something to your heart, has nudged something to your heart, would you raise your hand? Yes. How many others? Yes. God, I, I pray for every hand that's in this room. And I pray for the hands that didn't go up, Lord. I pray that we would be relational. That you would fill us with the ability by your Holy Spirit, not in our strength, but by your Spirit, Jesus, to do the things that you're nudging us to do, God. For those that you are calling to open back up and to become relational and, and, and that are, have been hurt, Lord, I pray that, that, that you would bring healing in those hearts. God, I, I pray that, that those that, that realize that they need to reach out of their, their core group, God, and, and they need to, to stop being a pond, Lord, but, but start having a, a river that flows out and breathes life, Jesus. I pray that, that you would give them opportunity to break bread. I pray that you would, you would uh, rise up new teachers and, and classes in this church, Jesus. So God, it's by your spirit 
It's not by our goodness, it's not by our works, but it's by and through your Holy Spirit that we can do these things, God. Give your people the strength to leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I find it very interesting that uh, yesterday I was um, watching, uh, well, it's not interesting that I was watching the basketball game, um, but uh, I was watching the, the Baylor-Kansas game, and uh, my dad called me up, and he goes, hurry, turn the channel to channel 13. And it was NBC Nightly World News or something like that. And, and just this week, the UK announced that there's going to be a new minister of loneliness. In, in like the executive branches, I don't understand how uh, all that works. I understand a little bit of how our government works, even though it's broken right now. Um, but in, in, in the, uh, the UK, you've got like the minister of defense. You've got all these different important executive government chairs. You have the minister of loneliness. That they're the first country in the world to ever have anything like this. One of the stats on TV said that, and I didn't see how many people were interviewed, but over 200,000 people said that it had been over a month since they had had a real conversation with anybody. More than just like, hey, your, your bill comes to $68.23. Thanks for shopping with us. 200,000 people hadn't had a conversation in over a month. I'm telling you, students, If Pastor Luke, Pastor Zach, myself, if your parents, if anybody walks into your school and there's someone sitting alone at a table, then either we've done something wrong or you've got a heart issue. Because Christians are relational. You know, and, and honestly, I, I understand it because I, I was in school and those kids that sit off and alone, they can be kind of nasty and you can come up to them and you can try to be their friends. And, and they're kind of standoffish. And maybe you guys can relate at work. There's someone who's just kind of mean and they spew. You know what that is? They've been hurt so many times that they want to get you away because they're afraid of being kicked again. Jesus didn't call us to love people that are easy. Jesus called us to love everyone. So this morning, my challenge to you before you leave, is to find someone new that you don't know. Maybe it's a generational gap. Maybe it's a cultural or ethnic gap. Maybe, maybe it's just someone that's just brand new to you. And I want you to, to get their name, exchange numbers, and set up a time to get to know them. Set up a time to get to know your church. God cares about you, and he cares about the people around you. So I'm gonna, I already found one person um, in, in the early service, um, and I'm going to find someone in this service that I, I don't know very well, and we're going to get together. And it might take a month and a half because my weekends for the next, like, six or seven weeks are, like, slammed, but we're going to get this done, and we're going we're gonna to be relational. And so that's my challenge to you this morning. Let's be a church that not just reaches together up to God, but reaches across the aisles and bears one another burdens and sharpens each other and encourages and loves one another. Amen? Amen. So before you leave, whether it's in here or out in the foyer, find someone you don't know, swap numbers, and I, I want there to, to be real action in this. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Go Vikings. Boo Patriots. We'll see you back at five o'clock. <laughs>